Hi, my name is Domi Sanchez. I'm a member of the Mid-Atlantic Antique Radio Club. My presentation is about the influence of women in early radio and television. I initially gave this presentation to Mark about 12 years ago. I've updated it since then. It's recently published in the February 2023 issue of Radio Age. If you're a member of Mid-Atlantic Antique Radio Club, you may have received a copy of this article, and I've hoped you've enjoyed it. This and all other Radio Age issues are archived on our website at mark.org, M-A-A-R-C dot O-R-G, in the members only section of the site. If you're not a member, you're cordially invited to join Mark and all these invaluable articles will become available to you. I wanted to give this presentation in March because this month is the International Women's History Month. The theme for 2023 is Celebrating Women Who Tell Our Stories. This presentation aligns with that theme by telling the stories of just a few of the pioneering women who were involved in the beginning of radio and television. With that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'll be still in the upper right-hand corner. My presentation will offer insights of women's influence through the decades, starting with the 1920s and quickly going through up to today. We're going to go through about 100 years worth of history. Well, obviously, we're not going to be able to cover all of those uh, decades, but we certainly will give it a try. I would like to give special thanks to Bill Goodwin and Ludwell Sibley for their research material on F.B. Chambers. Ludwell had written a wonderful article about F.B. Chambers, and it's published in Radio Age 1997. Also like to say thank you to Gary Alley and his research material on Nellie Tarago and Brian Belanger for his research materials on Mary Texana Loomis and also introducing me to Dr. Donna Halper. Here's a picture of Donna Halper. She's published quite a bit of research material on the internet, and it's all available to you. If you do a search on her name, a lot of stuff comes up. And Dr. Halper, if you happen upon this uh, presentation on YouTube, I want to personally thank you for all that material that uh, you published out there. She did publish a book, Invisible Stars, a social, uh, a social History of Women in American Broadcasting. The first issue was in 2021, and she came up with a second edition in 2014. Dr. Halper is credited for discovering the Canadian rock band Rush while she was a DJ at WMMS in Cleveland in 19, 1974. On June 25th, 2010, she was a speaker when Rush received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And there she is right in the center. So let's paint a picture of the 1920s just to give you some context there. Newspapers was king in communications, and they were reluctant to publish any print ads about radio because they viewed it as a competition. But way back then, we're just uh, the Victorian era was just an echo. More women were educated. Women were women were responsible for home entertainment, and this is an important point that will be echoed throughout this decade. Um, they bought music sheet, and they were very talented in terms of playing the piano and singing. So they were very familiar with music and home entertainment. Radio had its genesis in ham radio. Ham radio required a solid knowledge of mathematics, engineering, and some carpentry. These subjects weren't taught to girls, and they were often reserved for, generally, for white males, as well as politics, commerce, war, and engineering. Good music generally meant the classics and opera, and usually it wasn't available to the masses. You had to go into town and um, attend one of the theaters or movie theaters or music halls to hear good music. Also, music halls and theaters were segregated. 
So it wasn't available to the masses. Radio did make good music available to the masses, as well as those out in the distant rural towns. Often radio shops broadcasted sports over loudspeakers to draw crowds and to sell their radios. Back in 1920s, radio stars or talent often used their initials or call signs. Radios, um, women were typecast into fashion and homemakers. Now remember that audio tape was not yet, had not been, yet been invented. And it was difficult for getting phonographs to sound good with some of the primitive audio amplification. So there was a constant need of live performers. Engineers and technicians were often asked to perform on the air, often with dismal results. And they recruit, so they recruited family and friends. Talent scouts were often women. And remember that statement about women were in charge with home entertainment? Well, they knew the, the music industry, as it were. So they were often used to scout for talent to perform on the air. By 1927, women purchased about 75% of the merchandise that went into the home. Imagine this, coming out of the radio shack and into your home on top of your good furniture. Oh my goodness. And you could see the little sparks coming out of the wires there. Um, this doesn't look child friendly here or child safe or furniture safe for that matter. And oftentimes these batteries were filled with acid. Uh, could you imagine that leaking onto your furniture? So they had to do something uh, to make the furniture more appealing to the homemaker. And here you have it, a typical storefront displaying a bunch of nice radios. And they even had had a child uh, playing with a playing a radio, and you can see that it's child safe now. Atwater Kent used women in their factories because they believed that they had sharper eyes, nimbler fingers, and quicker re reflexes. Tiffany often used that same technique in their factories, and this is a typical um, uh, photograph out of the Atwater Kent. Here's another photograph of Atwater Kent and yet another photograph out of that company. And if you look very carefully here on the far left side, you could see the Atwater Kent logo on top on, in front of the, um, the radio panels. But notice something here. Women were on the production line. Guess where the men were? Out back managing the production line. So radio is a new medium. English language had to evolve to describe this new medium. New words emerged. At first there was wireless, then radio telephone. Then it became radiophone. Is it it wasn't about it wasn't until about 1923 when the term radio was meant to what we know it today. Phrases like sending was replaced by broadcasting and through the ether. This was known as heard on the air. Keeping your radio set on a certain broadcast frequently invoked the phrase stay tuned or tuned in. Live entertainment, if the guest didn't show up, the program director was expected to step in and entertain on the air. Prior to 1922, there was only a handful of commercial radio stations. By, the June, by June of that year, we saw several hundred stations on the air. Receiving good entertainment was the luck of the draw. And depending on what stations broke through with good atmospheric conditions, and also dependent on who walked into your studio that day. Now, radio could be e either viewed as a medium for entertainment, or education. And we see that theme over and over again. So let's talk about our first pioneering women in radio, Eleanor Nesbitt Pollier. Ms. Pollier was only 21 years old when her husband of only 13 months died. She was with a child and with the responsibility of raising that child, she fell into a deep depression. Her parents encouraged her to continue 
in her promising musical career, and she did that. Um, she was uh, an accomplished musician, uh, opera singer, and she performed from all the way from Dakotas, the Dakotas to New York and England. A new station took to the air on September 4th, 1922, WBAD of Minneapolis. Fulton Cutting and Bowden, Washington owned that station. Unfortunately, due to a lot of uh, mechanical mishaps, um, it folded. In addition to that, they just basically couldn't find enough talent to perform on the air. So they went and um, regrouped and they formed a new radio station in a nearby hotel on top of a nearby hotel called WLAG. And they scouted around looking for a possible director of entertainment. Well, Eleanor Pollier's name keep, kept popping up. And so uh, they hired her with only, what, 12 hours before WLAG came on the air. She did say yes. And um, with the promise that it was only be would only be a few hours a, a night. Back then, it was it was typical to broadcast only two or three evenings a week um, and only a few hours or a few minutes if, if it was that. Uh, but by the end of the year, under uh, Ms. Pollier's deck, uh, direction, um, it was um, on the air on a basically nightly in 19, late 1923. Now, because Ms. Pollier's um, dedication to good music, and remember, good music meant the classics and opera, um, Again, let's let's paint the context in which this decade was about. The biggest music, uh, the most popular music back then was jazz. So <laughs> classical music in the face of a jazz era, it wasn't a really good business model. So within a year, unfortunately, WLAG folded. Our next radio pioneer is Vaughn DeLay. In January 1920, the inventor and radio pioneer, Lee DeForest, brought her to his radio station in New York World Tower, where DeLay sang Swanee River. According to some historical accounts of this incident, having been, having been advised that high notes sung in her natural soprano voice might shatter the fragile vacuum tubes on her carbon microphone amplifier, Delay switched to a deep contra alto voice and in the process invented this singing technique called crooning. Our next pioneer is Mary Texana Loomis. This is a bit of a local legend here for us. She founded the Loomis Radio College. It was located in Washington. It was located in Washington D.C. on 9th and D, and its call sign was W3YA. Now, Dr. Belanger um, loaned me one of her books, and was able to go through it. And there it is: Radio Theory and, and Operating by Mary Texana Loomis. Now, here's a photograph of her in her classroom, and notice that her students are all young men. She did not allow women to sign up in her class, oddly enough. Our next radio pioneer is Ms. Nellie Trago of Kansas City, Kansas. Like Ms. Pollier, she was widowed in her 20s. She had to mortgage her house to survive, and with the 3000 she mortgaged, she started uh, a new company and bought a building with only three with only three employees. Within a year, the plant grew to cover an entire city block and had over 100 employees. In the April 1923 issue of Radio News, yes, on page 1868, 
a one tube regenerative receiver was advertised by this company. And you'll see that uh, ad in the, um, in the article that's published in Radio Age. For $33.75 today, that would have cost you just under $600. Our next radio pioneer of the 1920s is Mrs. F.B. Chambers. This particular artifact, the FB084 wireless standard time set, was sold to jewelers and watchmakers. At noon, the jeweler would tune in to set their timepieces accurately. Let's cover a few of the pioneering women of the 1940s. Martha Jane Roundtree was an American pioneering broadcast journalist and entrepreneur. She was the creator and first moderator of a public affairs program at, known as the American Mercury from 1945 to 1947. And she was a moderator for Meet the Press and co-founded Meet the Press in 1947. She was the only female moderator in the seven decade history of this show. WDIA is the heart and soul of Memphis, Tennessee. It went on the air in 1947 and it was the only all black music station. One of the early radio announcers was Martha Jean, the Queen Steinberg. Our next radio pioneer is Miss Frida B. Hannock. By 1924, she was the youngest woman lawyer practicing in New York City at the age of 22. She was a really strong advocate for educational television and lobbied for reserving channels for education. By 1948, President Harry S. Truman nominated her to be the commissioner for the FCC. By April 1952, the FCC permanently reserved channel assignments to 242 communities for educational stations, thus ensuring the future of public broadcasting in the United States. Hence, the broadcasting, Public Broadcasting Services was born. PBS. It was because of Ms. Hannock, PBS exists. Unfortunately, I'm out of time, so let me fast forward to the end of the slideshow and acknowledge some of our members. And on the right, we see Joanna Fabro receiving an award for her service as a MARC board member and coordinating speakers for our monthly meets. Thank you, Joanne. I would like to introduce our newest Radio Age editor, Donnie Gillespie, who came on board last year. Donnie, thank you for your contribution to Radio Age. So in conclusion, I thank you for your attention. I do hope you join me in celebrating Women's History Month by celebrating the women who tell our stories. Thank you.